Well, thank you very much. I feel more formal standing up in front of a lectern. Um, so, what did it like to be here with a very old and valued friend and colleague? Um, we've been talking about these things on and off for so many, so many decades, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, and what we wanted to do is to, um, is to debate, because we do take different views on this absolutely central question, one of the issues we were talking about before tea, about the way in which the issues to do with China and the US that we were touching on affect the future of Australia's positioning, if I can put it this way, and particularly the, the future of, of, of ANZUS. And I think the best way to organise this is to focus it around the, the sort of the, the focus of the, of the government's position on this question, which is, um, and I quote, we do not have to choose between a strong relationship with the United States and a strong relationship with China. Um, that formulation or very close variants of it are, I would say, the principal theme of Australian foreign policy today. Uh, Julia Gillard used it in her valedictory speech last night, uh, uh, I noticed, in the Blue Room at 10pm or whatever time it was. Um, so I want to explore that idea, that in the light of all of the stuff we've been talking about, Australia does not have to choose between the US and China. Um, uh, I think there are three ways to look at this. The first is to, to ask what we want to do. There's no doubt that we don't want to choose between the US and China. Australia's present situation uh, is uh, today, as a very secure and very prosperous country, is absolutely a reflection of the fact that for the last uh, 40 years, we have not had to choose between the US and China. We have been able to maintain a very close relationship with the United States, which has been fundamental to our security and we've been able to develop an economic relationship with China which has uh, transformed us economically. And you could say that we simply do not have any vision of Australia's future, any good vision of Australia's future, which doesn't presuppose that that continues to be the case. Uh, uh, economically, we see our, our economic future very closely tied to continue to sell more and more stuff to China. And we don't have another model of Australia's economy, which goes back to the thing we were talking about at the end of the last session. Uh, strategically, we have no model of our strategic future uh, except to continue to rely on the United States um, or else st face all the horrible choices that we were talking about. So we don't want to make this choice. The second point is that it's true that we haven't had to make the choice until now, that the reason we're in this happy position is precisely that because US primacy has been uncontested, because China has accepted American primacy as the foundation for the Asian order, because the United States has not seen China as a rival until now. Uh, it has been perfectly possible for Australia to develop this superb economic relationship with China and maintain a very strong re relationship with the United States um, so far. Um, but when I say so far, I think that's changing. But it's changing, when we think about how it's changing, I think we have to distinguish two kinds of choice. Uh, I don't think it's true today, I'm sure it's not true today, that we have to make what you might call the big choice. And when ministers say we don't have to choose between the US and China, what they very clearly imply, I think, is that we don't have to decide to abandon the US alliance and side with China, make the sort of big choice like that, or, or, or decide to side with the United States and abandon a relationship with China. We don't have to make that big choice right now. But I do think we have to make small choices about how we balance our relationship with the United States and China all the time. And this is new. Until a few years ago, it was the case that we could develop the relationship between the United States and the, relation, the relationship with the United States and the relationship with China essentially in separate boxes. Nothing about what we did with China affected what we were trying to do with the United States and vice versa. I think that has, that has ended. I think it's now the case that, that in the, uh, particularly in the strategic and, and political field, any choice we make in relation to either of those countries is read very carefully by the other. And that we have to pay very careful attention to the way in which our decisions in relation to one of those countries affects the decisions in relation to the other. And to that extent, we are making small choices, choices about how we position ourselves between them now in a way that we haven't had to do before. And there's a reason for that. And that is that for both the US and China, as their strategic rivalry escalates, increasingly Australia is significant to each of them on the political and strategic front, not economically, but politically and strategically, Australia is significant to each of them primarily 
as it affects their rivalry with the other. So Australia is important to China strategically as it affects its positioning in relation to the United States and vice versa. Um, so I think right now, although we don't have to make the big choice, we are having to make these small choices and already that's putting a lot of stress on our policy making. But the real question of course is about the future. It's not do we have to choose, but will we have to choose in future? And that's the key question because policy tends to be about the future. Will we in future have to make the big choice? The choice to go with the United States and abandon China or vice versa? Um, and it's worth making the point, I can't imagine circumstances in which we decide to abandon the United States and side with China against America. In fact, the choice is whether we go with the United States against China or step to neutrality between them. But the choice is huge and disastrous either way. Whether or not we have to make that choice depends absolutely on the trajectory of the US-China relationship. We, we don't we won't choose whether we have to choose between the US and China. They will choose whether we have to make that choice. And if either of them say we have to make that choice, then we have to make that choice. So what drives them to the position where they think we do? Well, I would say absolutely depends on the trajectory of their relationship with one another. And the deeper their rivalry becomes, the starker the choices we will face. And at a point, for example, a point at which they find themselves in direct armed conflict, the choice for us becomes very stark indeed. Now, what flows from that is the proposition that we don't have to choose, with the implication not just that we don't have to choose today, but we won't have to choose in future, is based on an optimistic judgment about the trajectory of the US-China relationship, which is very fundamental to the government's present policy. It's all the way through the Asian Century White Paper and it's right at the foundation of the 2013 Defence White Paper. It's there in paragraph 219, um, which says, roughly speaking, we think that these two countries will get on fine. Now, that's possible perfectly possible for the United States and China to get on well, for this option, the agree option, to occur. But the two points to make about that, the first is there's a real risk they won't. The trends at the moment, I would say, are heading in the wrong direction. Um, and moreover, in order to avoid that, in order to reverse those trends, in order to get back to an improving chance that the US and China will get on well enough for us to be able to avoid that choice, is going to require both the US and China to make very tough choices because it seems to me the only basis upon which the US and China can avoid the kind of escalating rivalry which, which uh, uh, allows us to get away without making the choice is for them to find a way to share power in Asia. The reason I say that is that I think what drives their rivalry are mutually incompatible visions of Asia's future leadership. Very to slightly oversimplified, China wants to lead Asia and America but wants to lead Asia. Neither of them will succeed in prevailing in that. Both of them will have to find a way to accept that the other is going to be part of what goes on, so they're going to have to find a way to share power. I think that is extraordinarily difficult for them both to do. Not impossible, and the incentives to make it work are very strong, but it's very difficult for them to do. And so the question becomes, which gets back to something that was raised uh, in the, our session before tea, is, well, if that's the outcome we want, the US-China agreement, understanding, which provides a setting in which Australia can avoid making the choice that we badly, desperately need to avoid making, what can we do to help bring that about? I think there is something we can do to help bring that about. I think we can help to promote between the US and China, not as an intermediary, but as a very strongly interested bystander, help to promote the development of an understanding both in Beijing and Washington about the need for both of them to compromise with the other in order to reach a mutually agreeable um, uh, position. Um, uh, I think that's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do is one of the most difficult strategic and diplomatic challenges Australia has ever faced. But on the other hand, this is perhaps the most important foreign policy challenge issue Australia has ever faced. So we shouldn't be surprised that it looks like a very big day in the office for your colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, but I don't think we're doing that yet. And the reason we're not doing it yet, because we keep pretending to ourselves we don't have to, because we pr keep pretending that we're not going to have to choose in future, because we keep assuming that this is all going to work out fine. Until we recognise the risk that it won't, until we recognise how important it is to us that it shouldn't go bad, that the US and China should produce a stable relationship with one another, we won't do what's required to uh, help minimise that risk. So the question for Australia today is not really whether we have to choose between the US and China today. It's whether we choose today to do anything to help shape the US-China relationship so we don't get forced to make that choice in the future. Thank you.
So let's hear it for the losing side. <laughs> <laughs> you, are, you are allowed to clap, um, particularly me. Um, well, it's a, look, it's a great opportunity to be able to debate um, Hugh. Uh, he's a very uh, experienced, very respected figure in Australian strategic policy circles. Um, and his book, The China Choice and the Quarterly Essay, which came before it, have certainly ignited um, an, an important debate about Australia's strategic choices. Um, and that's a bit of a shame because um, his policy, in his policy prescriptions, um, I would argue that Hugh is profoundly wrong. Um, and I'm going to set out what I regard as the major white wrongs here. There are four white wrongs. Um, and believe me, that's not easy to say and will only get harder <laughs> as the debate goes on. Um, white wrong number one. Um, I don't think it's necessary for us to make a choice between China and the United States. And obviously, I'll talk in some detail about that. White wrong number two. I don't think it's necessary, uh, or I don't think it's the case that the US is seeking to contain China. White wrong number three. I don't think it's inevitable that the US and China are on a collision course to military conflict. Uh, and finally, white wrong number four. I don't think that um, Asia-Pacific security would be enhanced if the US alliance network uh, in Asia was abandoned and if we replaced it with a concert of Asia. So let me talk to each of those issues in turn. White wrong number one, I don't think it's necessary for us to make a choice between China and the United States. The greatest weakness of Hugh's argument here is simply that there's not a shred of empirical evidence to support it. In fact, in the last two years, Australia's been able to make tremendous headway in relations with both countries. Earlier this year, Julia Gillard was able to negotiate a new strategic framework with China. And I think it's relevant to note that this happened, in fact, not before, but after um, uh, the events of uh, uh, November 2010, where the government announced our increased cooperation with, with the United States. Uh, in fact, it's precisely because we're in a close alliance with the US uh, that we're seen to be a, a significant partner that the Chinese want to, to work with. Now, I was uh, uh, myself in China as recently as last week, um, and some of the senior think tankers which I spoke to, I, I spent some time talking to the, uh, the CIISS, the Chinese International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, and the China uh, Contemporary International Relations Centre, um, were really at pains to say to me that they um, did not take uh, the deployment of US Marines in the north of the country as being in any way aimed at China. Um, they're sophisticated enough to understand that 2,500 Marines in Darwin is not a, a dagger pointed at the heart of uh, Beijing. Um, and in fact, uh, 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 I would say that um, although that is not particularly seen to be a, a, a strategically significant thing from a Chinese perspective, in some respects it is true to say that they almost write us off as a rusted on ally of the United States. The Chinese know that pressure from them about our alliance relationship with the US is unlikely to get anything other than a negative reaction from Australia. Now, China's own interests in Australia are largely economic. They're about uh, seeing us as a secure, long-term supplier for raw materials. And they're not going to put that relationship at risk in order to pick a fight with us that they can't win over asking us to reduce or walk away from our alliance relationship. Now, China has, in recent years, I would say, gone through the experience of um, a year or two of living arrogantly. Um, that was 2009 and 2010, when they were pressuring countries in ASEAN to bow to Beijing's wishes on China's South China Sea claims. In essence, China's more aggressive approach <coughs> backfired. Uh, when China pressures Asia to make choices, Asia chooses the United States. Um, and what did we see over that period of time? Singapore agreed to enhance defence cooperation with the U.S. 
and is now hosting a number of literal combat ships uh, and is about to announce very soon the acquisition of a substantial number of joint strike fighters. The Philippines has been considering providing port access back at the old US base of Subic Bay. Malaysia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand have all enhanced their defence cooperations with the US and even Myanmar, right, which was once um, a client state essentially of the US, has looked to open relations with um, a, a client state of China, has looked to open relations with the US uh, to embrace political reform and to distance themselves from that once close relationship with Beijing. After that failed experiment of the years of living arrogantly, China has come to realise that, that pushing countries to choose will not work in its interests. The lesson for Australia is, if we choose, we lose. No Australian government is going to do that. That takes me to white wrong number two. I don't think it's the case that the US is seeking to contain China. Now, this language about containment harks, harks back to another relationship, a relationship between the US and the Soviet Union, really covering the period from Harry Truman through to Ronald Reagan, where the Americans did indeed seek to um, constrain, contain Soviet expansionism. Now, one thing to be said for that policy is it actually worked. It, it was a, a major contribution to ushering in the collapse of the Soviet Union. But China is a different case. You don't contain 1.2 billion people. And in fact, um, unlike the US and the Soviet Union, what has happened between the US and China has actually been the most remarkable process of economic and financial integration ever seen in history. Uh, people talk about connections between Germany and the UK before 1914 and how that didn't stop those two countries from going to war. But, but that level of really trade integration is as nothing compared to the sense of mutual dependence that has been created between China and the United States. Economically, the two countries have become symbiotically linked. Now, can Laurel contain Hardy? Can Kath contain Kim? Uh, can Andy contain Hamish? No chance. Um, they're simply too close. Now, the absence of containment doesn't mean to say that there isn't competition, okay? And I think we're going to see more of this in coming years, particularly in terms of military interaction in the Asia-Pacific. Now, this is obviously something to watch, and I'm going to talk in a minute about the prospects for conflict, but it would be wrong to characterise that as containment. Firstly, the US has a long list of legitimate interest which brings it and has brought it into this region for several centuries. And those interests today include its alliance relationships, not only with Australia, but also with Japan and South Korea. The US also has compelling interests in ensuring freedom of navigation uh, at sea and in the air, um, and freedom of the use of uh, space and cyberspace. They've had a substantial presence in Asia for two centuries, and that's not going to change. Now, I think the Chinese use of the term containment is really just a diplomatic tactic. Right, to try to limit US activities in areas where the Americans have operated forever. The reality is that the Chinese and, militaries, Chinese and US militaries will just have to learn to interact in the same way that the US and the Soviets did in the 60s and 70s. As President Xi said to uh, Obama in uh, sunny lands, the Pacific is big enough for both China and the US. I think that's where they'll end up on that. What wrong number three? Um, I don't think it's inevitable that the US and China are on a collision course to military conflict. I start from the position of that deep sense of economic codependence that has been created between the two of them. Will China and the US go to war? Well, there are strong arguments, I think, to say they won't. Hugh's position on this really derives from an observation about the pattern of history uh, more, I think, than a empirical assessment of the relations between the two countries. And the pattern of history that Hugh's referring to is one whereby established powers feel challenged by rising powers, and the result is a conflict between them. Um, in Hugh's book, he quotes the historian Thucydides in the Peloponnesian War. What made the war inevitable was the growth of Athenian power and the fear which this caused in Sparta. Uh, 
Now, I've seen claims, I think Joe Nye says this, you uh, 15 cases in history where competition, um, uh, sorry, 11 of 15 cases in history where competition has uh, been created between a rising power um, and an established power, which has led to war. But I would like to point out a couple of differences between the current situation uh, between China and the US and the situation that prevailed in 4th century BC Greece. First, military commanders no longer decide battle tactics on the basis of chicken entrails. <laughs> Second, national strategy is no longer decided on the basis of hallucinations of priests at Delphi. Third, the tides of battles and invasions are no longer turned by the mysterious appearances of doves or bolts of lightning, for which strategists, contemporary strategists, <laughs> can be very grateful. Um, in fact, um, I think the analogy is not strictly right. You know, Athens and Sparta were much more closely balanced in terms of power than is the case between China and the United States. And also, the two cities were much less integrated than China and the United States, and they had less stake in each other's survival. Now, I don't rule out the possibility that there could be incidents or clashes um, in US-China relations, like the EP3 incident in 2009, where a US aircraft was hit in midair and forced down. But uh, actually, uh, that incident demonstrated that China and the US have the capacity to manage crises between them. And finally, uh, China very clearly realises that it is overmatched by the US in terms of the military power ba balance in the Asia Pacific. It's close to being overmatched by Japan, frankly, let alone uh, the United States. So where do I think this will go? I think what we'll see is there'll be a growing military accommodation between the two countries. And we'll see over time a growing web of confidence building measures and crisis management mechanisms between the two. Uh, and then we, let me come finally to white wrong number four. Um, I don't think that the Asia Pacific, that Asia Pacific security would be enhanced if we abandoned <coughs> the US alliance uh, network in Asia and replaced it with a concert of Asia. Now by using the term concert, Hugh is referring to the post-Napoleonic concert of Europe. And I understand him to mean, when he talks about it in the Asian context, that what we're talking about here is an explicitly formed group of major powers, uh, the, the US, China, Japan, and India. And these powers would meet to manage a kind of imposed um, status quo between them. Now, my starting point on this is to say no country, no country in the region actually wants this. Certainly not China, which realises that the US alliance network actually promotes Beijing's interests. It keeps Japan and South Korea non-nuclear and under control. It provides the stability in the region, which has allowed China the opportunity to focus on internal growth and political control. And it's also saved China a huge amount of money by not forcing it to provide a vastly expensive regional security good. In fact, China has shown no interest except in token areas like counter piracy operations off the Somali coast. China has shown no interest to actually step up to the challenge of providing for regional, let alone global, security. Um, Japan is not interested in the concert of Asia idea because under Hughes' prescriptions, they would distance themselves from the US and consider acquiring nuclear weapons to establish a deterrent relationship with China. Fantastic outcome, that. Um, India is certainly not interested in the idea of a concert of power because it's not a joiner um, and because it remains preoccupied with its neighbour Pakistan and the stability of the small states that surround it. It has little, if anything, to contribute to North Asian security. And of course, none of the smaller countries in the region like the idea because it will reduce their influence and make them, in effect, pawns in a game dominated by just two major powers. I think overall 
uh, and I'm sure by now you will agree with me, that the best mechanism to provide stability and security in the Asia-Pacific is the existing US alliance network. And for Australia, that means the ANZUS alliance. Uh, it gives us a strong and influential voice in Washington. You can test the influence of being independent and non-aligned by looking at New Zealand, which does not have a strong and influential voice in Washington. ANZUS lifts our credibility in Asia because it means we've got a military which is as technologically sophisticated as the US and an intelligence base which is second to none. It allows Australian governments to keep defence spending low compared to what we would have to spend if we weren't in an alliance. Um, that's the positive way to put it. My friend Mark Thompson would, would talk about Australian free riding at, at this point. But, but it enables us to, to do that. Um, and the US nuclear deterrent means that we don't have to worry about maintaining our own nuclear deterrent. Now, you know, you had a, a, a seminar on Tuesday about the risk of a nuclear breakout, but you shouldn't discount the pressures that would be applied to Australia in similar circumstances if we were outside of an alliance relationship. So ANZUS is high cost, high, <laughs> let's start that one again, ANZUS is low cost and high value to Australia. Why choose when we don't have to? Thank you. Well, very tidy indeed. Um, okay, uh, no, that's really, it's, uh, I've, you know, one of the advantages of sticking your head above the parapet is you get all sorts of opportunities to hear people disagree with you. And uh, uh, I haven't heard a more elegant and tidy um, uh, a set of counter arguments uh, in, in two or three years of very intense debate. So, but let me pick up each of your four points at, at once, at one at a time rather. Um, we don't have to choose. Um, uh, as I said before, I think the, the, the question here uh, is not what we've had to do hitherto, or even what we have to do right now, but what we have to do in future. Um, it is true that we have until very recently managed to maintain these two relationships very effectively. I differ somewhat in the way you interpret what's happening right now though. China is certainly, I agree, China is not forcing us now or even asking us now to abandon the alliance with the United States. I think that's because it feels that things are moving its way anyway. It reads the 2009 white paper. It reads the 2013 white paper. It looks at the difference in treatment of China and it asks what's changed. And what's changed is the extent to which Australia has felt under pressure from China to change the way we talk about China's role in the region. Uh, it looks at uh, the Marines, uh, the decision to deploy the Marines to Darwin. It looks at uh, Stephen Smith's evasion, and for that matter, Bob Carr's evasion, uh, of the question of the future trajectory of those uh, of activities with the United States at the Osmin last year, and it says, hmm, Canberra's backing off. So it feels it doesn't have to press us. We're pressing ourselves on this. We're, we're, it feels things are going, are going fine. So I'd, 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 I think uh, I absolutely agree with Peter that, that that we have not at this stage had to choose. I'm less, much less confident that we're not already under pressure to which we are responding without them even actually pressing too hard. But the key issue, of course, is whether that remains the case and how far that remains the case in future. And that is, as I said, all about the trajectory of the US-China relationship. So it brings me to the second point, and that is a question about, about whether the United States is containing China. And this is critical, obviously, because the extent that the United States is containing China, then we should expect or could expect that the US-China relationship will become more adversarial and the pressures for us to make that choice in future increase. So the, the point that Peter's making here is a very um, important one. Um, I think it's important to hear, distinguish here between what the United States says it's doing and what it's smart for the United States to do and what it's actually doing. Um, I, I absolutely agree that the United States doesn't say it's containing China. In fact, it says it's not containing China. Uh, United States, there's no way the United States wants to find itself drawn into escalating strategic rivalry with China. It just wants China to accept US primacy as the foundation for the Asian order. 
And the proposition that it's not containing China is based on, on its optimism that China will accept that and therefore won't need to be contained. It will, or to put it another way, it will sort of self-contain. Now, I think if you look at, for example, the Obama doctrine, the, the, the approach to China that, are, that Obama articulated in the speech up in Parliament House in November 2011, I think that was very clearly, very clearly articulated a US approach to Asia and to China, which placed the preservation of US primacy as the foundation for the Asian order at the heart of, of America's strategic agenda in Asia. That is what America is trying to do. Now, that does not lead to containment of China if China accepts it. It does lead to containment of China if China doesn't accept it. And my view is that China doesn't accept it. When Xi Jinping goes to sunny lands and talks about a new model of great power relations, that's what he means. He means he doesn't like the old model. And he doesn't just say it once. He says it all the time. I think the evidence that China is actively seeking to contest American primacy and that America is actively seeking to preserve American primacy as a foundation for the order is very strong. And if that's true, then there are three possibilities. One side will back down, or the other side will back down, or they'll find themselves in a containment, counter-containment struggle. And I think that's what we're seeing already. Now, of course, I agree with Peter that the interdependence is extremely important in this. Uh, and in fact, I think interdependence provides enormous incentives for them to find a way to sort this out. Um, but uh, I don't think they've seen that yet. And my own reading of US policy is not that the interdependence makes, means that the United States is not trying to contain China, it just means that it's dumb to be doing what it's trying to do because the interdependence is going to make it so enormously costly. That leads us to the third point about inevitability. I absolutely agree. Uh, escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China is not inevitable. I wish I remembered enough Greek to remember what word has been translated as inevitable in that famous quote from Thucydides. Because if that's what he was said, he was wrong. It didn't make war between Athens and Sparta inevitable. It did make it pretty likely. It did actually drive it to happen. It didn't make it inevitable. Um, but I, so I, I, I completely agree. It, nothing is inevitable. Well, very little is inevitable. But I do think the risk is very high. Um, and the reason I think the risk is high is precisely because I think there is that very fundamental um, uh, divergence in, in basic strategic objectives between the two countries. In their, in their aspirations for their roles in Asia. Um, I think Peter's argument depends on the proposition that we can be confident that these two countries will be smart enough to manage these things better, better than they did in Athens and Sparta. Well, we have some recent data on the quality of strategic policy making in the United States. It's called Iraq. Well, maybe they would have been better off with chicken entrails. We cannot assume that the United States will get this right. It's not that the United States system is not very good, but it makes mistakes. And I must say, for me, the strategic error of Iraq was a very significant influencer of my judgment about the risks in Asia. The United States can get this wrong. Moreover, it's not just the United States. It's a broader point about our confidence in international society. There is a strong view, a view that I have a bit of sympathy with, that things between the US and China can't get that bad because we've, we've learnt the lessons. We know that it'd be so stupid to let that happen. But it is worth bearing in mind that what that presupposes is that we as societies or we as individuals are wiser or better people than, in my case, my grandparents were or your great-great-grandparents or something, that the people who in 1914 watched their world slide into a catastrophe were somehow stupider than us or worse than us. And I'm here to tell you they weren't. They were surprisingly like us. They'd lived through 100 years of peace. They were terribly confident in the remarkable new world order they'd built. They were terribly optimistic about where it was going. A and yet the whole thing came apart in their hands. And we still don't quite know how it happened. It, it's, 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 it's not as though 
the, 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 the wars only happen because someone's dumb enough to want it to happen. Wars happen because people aren't smart enough to avoid them. And I'm not persuaded we're any smarter than our ancestors were. Moreover, when you ask yourself, well, what's required to avoid it? It is an accommodation. Peter spoke about the idea of there being an, an, a, a, a military accommodation between the US and China in Asia, which will avoid the inevitability of conflict. Well, I do think that's a possibility. That's why I don't think conflict's inevitable. But that accommodation is going to require compromises by both sides. It's an accommodation that will have to come from both sides. That's based on a judgment very deeply embedded in my analysis that China is not going to give us everything we want. That China is now too strong and too confident of its own power to do that. And so the question is, what's the basis of the accommodation which avoids the risk of escalating rivalry and takes us and steps us back from, uh, from conflict, which makes the case that conflict's not inevitable? Well, that gets us to Peter's fourth point, which is the idea, question about what's the best structure in Asia? Um, I think that the model I, I present, as Peter said, the concept of Asia model, is based on the idea that the, the region's great powers, not just the US and China, but Japan and India as well, uh, get together and do a deal about sharing power in Asia. It doesn't actually have to be explicit. It doesn't have to be as explicit as the one that was done by the Europeans, but it does have to be a very, at least a very clear implicit deal. And, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and um, uh, I, I tell you, nobody has more reservations about the idea of a concert of Asia than I do. It's extraordinarily hard to bring it about. I don't predict it'll happen. I predict it won't. That's why my red line goes where it does. And even if it did, it would be a very difficult structure and full of disadvantages. The only argument in favour of a concert of Asia is that it's better than escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China. Now, if there's another way of avoiding escalating strategic rivalry, another way that doesn't involve, involve reaching an accommodation between them, I'd be very keen to see it. But the only argument I have in favour of the concert is that it's better than the alternative. In particular, the alternative of maintaining US primacy as the foundation for the Asian order, which is, the, which is un, implicit in the idea of keeping the US alliance structure as the foundation for the Asian order, is not, to my mind, a way of avoiding escalating strategic rivalry because I don't believe China will accept it. Why do I believe China won't accept it? Because they say they won't accept it. They say they want a new model of great power relations and they act as if they won't accept it. So for us, I completely agree. If I could have my choice, uncontested US primacy as the foundation of the Asian order built on the San Francisco alliance system should last forever. I love it. I have a horrible feeling that life is never going to be as good for Australia again. And if the choice was between a concert of Asia and maintaining uncontested US primacy on the basis of that alliance structure, I would have a very easy choice to make. I'd be exactly with Peter. But I think the choice is not that, I don't think that's the choice is there because I don't think China is going to accept it. And I think that China will be prepared to push and disrupt the order and take significant strategic risks as it is already in order to establish at least a position of equality. And the idea of the concert model is to find, uh, find a way in which that concession to China can be made as safely, as prudently, as parsimoniously as possible, to give China the least we possibly can, to preserve the United States the strongest role we possibly can, to produce the, the strongest possible guarantees that China doesn't demand more and expect more, consistent with giving us a chance of avoiding that escalating strategic rivalry. Thank you. All right, all right. Some very, very strong points there. Um, not, not all of which I can refute, but I can refute some. Um, Hugh's first point, well, China isn't forcing us to choose because we're really kind of self-choosing. Um, and therefore they don't need to exert pressure on us. Um, uh, look, I think that is a risk. Um, I've, I've certainly written about it and analysed it in that way in terms of my own read of a number of comments that Bob Carr in particular has made as Foreign Minister. I think that's because uh, Carr is frankly much more equivocal about the alliance relationship uh, than he 
frankly, his brief allows him to be yeah, as, uh, as foreign minister. And uh, yeah, if we're dumb enough, absolutely. I mean, the, the, there is no question that the Chinese who are um, the ultimate sort of rational actor models of um, advancing their own interest will take every gain that we're prepared to offer them. <laughs> no question. And really what it comes down to is are we going to be smart enough in terms of our national ability to articulate our own interests to stop that from happening? Um, I mean, having created a strategic dialogue uh, with uh, the Chinese, um, I, I, I think that it's uh, uh, something that you know, we're going to have to be very wary of the next time that our prime ministers and ministers get together to meet. What are our core interests of which we will not budge? For me, the alliance has to be one of these things. If we're prepared to volunteer up some sort of concession, um, the Chinese will say, well, thank you very much for that. You know, aren't you, aren't you Australians being obliging? So uh, you know, my, my sense here is that we have you know, nothing to fear but ourselves uh, in terms of our, our willingness to kind of uh, self-wedge. And a wedge is an uncomfortable thing, and we ought not to, uh, we ought not to do it. Um, is the US focused on retaining primacy in the Asia-Pacific as opposed to containment of China? Yeah, yeah, um, and that's a damn fine thing. Um, is China seeking to, it seems to me that China's capacity to contest primacy though has really got to be measured on something other than gross national output. You can't contest American primacy if you don't have a model of your own primacy that is something the region wants to sign up to. And who wants to sign up to China's model? Pakistan, um, a state that's not a state, a state that is a disguise for an army, uh, which is falling its apart. Um, the DPRK, um, you know, the most backward eccentric dictatorship in the world that looks at China as a modern development risk, actually, ra rather than anything else. Iran, uh, well, no model there. Um, Myanmar, uh, well, they're the fourth of China's closest friends, as I say, has, has, I think, stepped back from the brink, took quite a deliberate strategic decision in 2010 to say we are not going to allow ourselves to go down this path of becoming purely a client state of the Chinese. China doesn't have a model. And the fact of the matter is, is that even to China's own population, the model that makes American primacy successful is what the Chinese population wants. They want the middle class lifestyle, they want to be able to Twitter and Facebook or the Chinese equivalents of those things. They want to send their kids to Western universities, they want to own property, they don't want to be arbitrarily arrested or tortured by their own governments. The US model of primacy works. It's the model that the Chinese population wants and that's why it's feared by the Chinese government. Um, and it seems to me that ultimately soft primacy, if I can put it that way, US soft power is ultimately working. That's the solution, the long-term solution to Hugh's um, conundrum about how do we move to a more stable dispensation in this part of the world. We'll move to it when China um, adopts in terms of its own internal social policies the primacy model that the US, of, of US society, of structures and systems, of the rule of law, of capitalism. Um, and it's some way towards that, uh, that process. Interestingly, what I'm struck by in talking to the Chinese um, is not the sense of strength which you see, um, particularly in sort of hyper-nationalist comments from Chinese senior colonels on the lookout for promotion in media. Um, it's actually the Chinese fear of its own weakness, which is, I think, the most compelling feature of how China thinks about itself. And what does it fear? It fears instability. It fears the party losing control. It fears the sort of spontaneous risings that we see in Brazil and in Indonesia and uh, in many places around the world, which is going to go beyond the capacity of the internal security forces to fix. It fears that it can't grow fast enough to keep that in a bottle, basically. Um, and um, I, I, I think that you know the way to think about China is not so much, much about focusing on it, its strengths, uh, so much as it is its decision-making mm. is driven by its weaknesses. But those weaknesses are the things that will stop it competing for 
American primacy in this part of the world. Uh, we can't assume that the U.S. will get it right. Um, yeah, that's that's certainly true. Um, uh, I, I'm, I've given up trying to defend the Iraq War, uh, Hugh. <laughs> I did have a go a couple of no months way, back. Got, got it was sustained for a long time. Got flayed remarkably uh, <laughs> comprehensively. Um, but look, I think the, the real problem here is not so much about the propensity of the Americans to go to war. Um, the thing we should be most concerned about is the reluctance of the Americans to continue to want to do that. Um, I mean, they have inculcated precisely the wrong lesson from Iraq, which is it's best not to do this. Um, and it seems to me the, the threshold of American um, mili intervention, willingness to use their military force is much higher than it used to be. And that's a positive in terms of the relationship with China. It does mean that they will get to a point where some of the concessions that Hugh talks about will have to be made. Um, if you want to have an early indicator and warning about that, I'd, I'd look at American surveillance um, um, up and down the Chinese coast. In fact, they are walking away from that now, sensibly enough, um, and that is a concession to the Chinese, not that the Americans would uh, publicly acknowledge it, but I think a sensible one given the, the growth of Chinese military power. Um, so can it all come apart? Yeah, sure, it could. Um, and again, I'm partly going to be agreeing with Hugh here. I think the biggest risk we face in the region is nationalism, you know, good old-fashioned 19th century nationalism that will force dumb choices primarily on the Chinese government uh, or possibly the, the Japanese government or the Taiwanese government. Um, and that is a risk, but um, I, I, I don't think beyond our capacity to handle. Um, now... So the, Hugh's final point is the what accommodations do you need to make and he, he comes to his concert of Asia. Um, he tells you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, no one has more reservations than him about the weaknesses of this concept. I have more reservations <laughs> than you, Hugh. I have deep reservations. Um, I think that the biggest weakness in that, um, apart from the fact that it's just simply not going to happen, is the, is the proliferation impact that, that is inherent in removing Japan from the alliance relationship with the United States. And where Japan goes on nuclear weapons, um, South Korea will rapidly go on nuclear weapons. The concert is, is uh, sort of a recipe, I think, for widespread nuclear proliferation. Now, you might say that's great. You know, Kenneth Waltz's argument is that, in fact, if we all had these things, we'd be a much more stable society. But look, I'll put my bet on the, on the US alliance relationship and extended nuclear deterrence, I think that's cheaper and safer. And I'd much prefer that to encouraging any steps that take us down that widespread proliferation path. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, now, I think what happens at this point, Carl, we've got until when? We've got until five. Five? If we, if we want to keep going. Um, uh, uh, what's going to happen now is uh, uh, Laurel and Hardy or <laughs> Kathy <laughs> Kim um, will Which happily take <laughs> <laughs> will happily take questions from the floor um, that relate specifically to kind of the discussions we've had today, and then we'll we'll have a, a bit of a wrap up in the end. So yeah, I'm just going to sort of ask the question I asked for um, Marshall and Steve. You've both talked about the risk of things going horribly wrong. <laughs> yes. uh, no, he's still minister. He said he'll serve up until the election, okay. but he's not contesting his seat. Um, anyway, so the current yeah. minister, um, <laughs> Cur current but soon to be former. Yeah. Uh, Australia has no place um, in, a, in talking to it between the US and China. Um, I think Bob Carr has made sort of similar noises. Is there anything Australian policy can do to try and improve the relationship and lock in confidence building measures? Um, well, I agree with Smith to the extent that w this idea of a bridge between the two is, is not going to work. Neither China nor the US needs it. Uh, and in fact, a, a point I had thought but then forgot to mention about Hughes' pessimism on, on the US is just the depth and the quality of their thinking on China. 
I, I find is quite remarkable. I mean, we do like to fool ourselves a little bit in this country to imagine that, you know, boy, we're crash hot in terms of understanding China internal. But, you know, if you look at our intelligence capability, it's very thin. You know, we've got m more uh, Pashtu speakers than uh, Mandarin speakers in the intelligence community for, for obvious reasons right now. So the go-between, no, no, that's not going to work. But what I think we can do is to play a sort of a testing role in both capitals to say, are you guys thinking hard enough about this issue? And we certainly have the capacity to do that pretty well with the United States, and do, actually. Uh, not, not as comprehensively as I would like, but you know there are um, a, a series of structured engagements that we go through in the course of the year which enable us to sort of test the mettle of American thinking on these issues. Um, I, I think we'll also find ourselves in a better position to do that with China in coming years too because we don't bring the baggage with us that um, the Americans do when they go to talk. Um, I think that um, the PLA um, has in fact used the ADF as a bit of a test case in the last five or six years to work out how you engage with developed high quality Western military forces. Uh, not because we're so brilliant, but because you can test it with the Aussies and then see how it works in, in the American system. Uh, and so I think we've, we've started to buy ourselves some capacity to um, uh, shape and influence uh, Chinese thinking uh, in terms of are you guys really ready for that relationship with the US that you now say you want to have? Yeah, uh, look, really, really good question, um, and and central to the whole the whole issue. So, first point, absolutely agree with uh, with Peter. Um, uh, I I don't for a moment think that Australia is an intermediary between the US and China. They, they, these these two countries are perfectly capable of speaking to one another. Um, uh, but I think it's a bit of a straw man for, for example, Smith and and uh, Carr, just having said we don't play a role as an intermediary, says we don't have a role. We have an interest. And it's a job of good foreign policy where you have an interest to find a role for yourself. And I think we can play a significant role in this. Um, because if my model is right, um, uh, avoiding escalating strategic rivalry and therefore being a, a, avoiding being forced to a choice requires the US and China to reach some form of understanding about their future relationship with one another. Um, it seems to me that they are at the moment a fair way from that. And so what Australia needs to do is to, is to find as many ways as we can to try and press both of those countries towards <coughs> recognising that that kind of accommodation is what we think they should do. And you might say, hey, who the hell is Australia? Why should we have any say? Well, I don't think we should underestimate our significance. After all, Barack Obama came to Canberra to give what the United States still sees as its number one speech on the China story. That's the speech they always refer to. He came to Canberra to give it. There's a reason for that. We matter to the United States. We keep on talking about how much the alliance gives us access to the United States. We don't use that access very much, at least not for serious stuff. So I, th I, th I think we have clearly have, or at least we should have, as a country, we should have the capacity to shape American thinking about this, and we should also have the capacity to shape Chinese thinking on this, if this relationship is going anywhere. The second point is that we'll only do that if we've got a clear message to deliver. And the message that says, we'd like you guys to get along, is not good enough. Of course they know that. We need to take the extra step and say, and this is the way we think you have to do it. So I think in order for Australia to have an impact on the trajectory of the US-China relationship, we have to have a model to how we think it ought to work. Now, that's what I've been trying to develop, what that model should look like. Um, to a certain extent, I don't mind what model we end up pushing, but if we don't have a very clear idea to put on the table, we won't have any influence. I'm, I know this is true in Beijing, but I'm even sure that it's true in Washington. I've spent a lot of my life wandering around Washington trying to sell ideas. And the thing about Washington, it's a very open town. It's an open market for ideas. Anybody can go there, set up a stall and put forward a proposition. But if you don't have a proposition on the table, if you just want to talk generalities, you'll be out the door in five minutes. I mean, my own experience of this, arguing a proposition that most Americans find peculiar and quite a few of them find actually vaguely offensive, that is, you should treat China as an equal, but their willingness to engage you, to drag you and drag you into the debate. It's one of the things I love about America. They will debate anything. 
of the, 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 and, 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 you know, we, sh we should take advantage of that. The third point is we don't have to do this alone because, you know, Peter mentioned the fact that, that you know, we're not in this by ourselves. Every country in Asia is looking at the US-China relationship just the way we are. What the hell does this mean for us? And I think every country in Asia has exactly the same response to us as we do. Nobody wants to live under China's shadow. And everybody knows that keeping the US engaged is the best way to avoid living under China's shadow. So everyone wants the US to stay engaged. But nobody wants to live with the consequences of escalating US-China rivalry. Nobody wants to have to make that choice. And so everybody wants the US to stay engaged on the basis that avoids escalating rivalry. And in the end, that means on the basis that China is in the end willing to accept. Now, I would say, because I don't think the Chinese are going to give way, or at least not going to give way on everything, that that means that there's going to need to be an accommodation. And you can go to Jakarta or Singapore or KL or Seoul or even Tokyo and make the argument that we all have an interest in going to both the US and China and saying, don't, don't assume that we're going to back either of you in competition with the other. What we want you to do is to do a deal. And you get a lot of agreement. I think, for example, Indonesia is well and truly on the move on this. I think Singapore is well and truly on the move on this. So I think, I think there is a possibility for us not to go by ourselves, but one way or another, to go with the rest of Asia and to convey this message to the US and China. So I think there's quite a lot we can do. Am I sure it'll work? No, not for a minute. But my goodness, we'd look really dumb if 30 years from now, you're here and your successes are sitting out there, we've got a defence budget at 6% of GDP, living in a region which is torn apart. And somebody says, what did you guys do back then to try and stop this happening? And the answer so far is we haven't done anything. So it's worth a try. I mean, what do we lose by anything else? 6% of GDP? Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to... You know. <laughs> that includes the nuclear weapons. <laughs> Uh, so one, uh, two, and then three. Is, is the US, or, or are there figures in the US who are cognizant of impending loss of strategic primacy despite ongoing military economies in our region? Um, that's actually quite a, it's a good question and it's not a very easy one to answer. Um, I, I'm conscious I, I often end up sounding less pro-US than I am, if you know what I mean, because I really am. I mean, I've spent my whole career in this business with the alliance. Um, but I think this is an issue that Americans, even very sophisticated Americans, find very hard to get their head around. Um, uh, and so I think there is a difficulty Americans even, and I gr agree with Peter, by the way, that the depth of expertise on China in the United States is phenomenal. It's a huge reservoir of expertise. So if you want to know what's happening in China, it's all there, every imaginable detail. If you want to know the detail of what's happening in the US-China relationship, who said what to whom, which exercises were taking place, then unbelievable amount of data. If you want to say, what the fuck does all this mean? Then it is, it's, it's a hard thing, because it's very hard for Americans to come to terms with the idea that, that the US should treat China as an equal. I use that phrase when I'm talking to Americans deliberately because it's so provocative. Um, but also because I think it's true. I mean, that's the other thing. Um, and uh, what I find is very few Americans say, yeah, that's right, absolutely, of course. But quite a few Americans say, yeah, mm, that's really hard. Yeah, okay. I, I don't think this is an impossible argument to make in the United States. Um, Australia could make that argument? And, oh, Australia, can, Australia can make it. I mean, it's, it's an argument that, that gets attention. And it's also an argument that gets attention in China. I mean, the, the Chinese are interested in this argument. I'm not saying they agree with it for a moment. They like some parts of it and don't like others. They like the bit where, where it says the United States should treat China as an equal. They don't like the bit where that means that China has to treat the United States as an equal. I guess the argument, though, that, that because you guys are approaching a lack of strategic uh, privacy, yeah. despite your military performance, you should listen to us. And, uh, well, I think... I mean, I... I, I, I I think it's, well, one of the tricks is to make sure that you distinguish between a proposition that the US is in decline, which is not true, and the proposition that, it's, that China is rising, which really is. And one of, the, one of the lines that I use in the US which gets the greatest shock factor is a very simple piece of arithmetic, and that is that 
that China is the most formidable country that the United States has ever faced, because the United States has, since it became a global power at all, and roughly speaking in the 1880s, has never faced a country whose economy is as big relative to the United States as China's is today. China's economy is twice as big relative to the United States as the Soviet Union's ever was at the height of the Cold War, on the most optimistic interpretation of how big Soviet GDP was. It's the most formidable country you've ever faced, guys, so don't assume you can treat it the way you've treated all the others. Um, and, you know, it goes back to the point that Peter made, quite a few Americans, less so now, but a few years ago when I first started making these arguments, saying, yeah, look, sure, you know, we're going to, have, we're going to be joined into a strategic rivalry with China. That's OK. We beat the Soviet Union. We'll beat the Chinese which I said, two problems. The first is, you beat the Soviet Union, but we did nearly have nuclear war along the way, and, you know, we'd rather not go through that if we can avoid it. But the second thing was, there's a big difference between China and the Soviet Union, that is, its economy works. And that's all the difference in the world. So I, I, I'm, I think this argument can be made in the United States, but I think it is a difficult one for the United States to accommodate, for reasons which I completely understand. Um, and that's one of the reasons why outsiders particularly, I might say, outsiders like Australia, we are, after all, the guys in the Western Pacific with whom they identify most closely, have, have got a role to play. And, as I say, I'm not sure it'll work, but why not give it a try? I take a slightly different take on it. Um, uh, two, two points. One, the US has never been as primacied as, as we like to think. I mean, there have always been significant limits to American power. Um, and it's not unusual that it finds itself in that kind of situation now. The other point is I think you need to uh, sort of dig into the concept of what primacy actually means. You know, for a bit of shorthand, we do kind of say economic parity in terms of gross national product, you know, is, is, is a measure of primacy. But, you know, even on that scale, at, at 1.2 billion people, what that buys China is a lot of poverty, a whole lot of poverty. You know, an atmosphere you can't breathe, a healthcare system that's collapsed, a banking system that's rife with corruption. Um, this is not a country that's yet at primacy with the US and won't be for a very long time. Um, and then there are other elements of primacy which I think need to be brought into play. Um, the capacity to bring um, high explosive onto target. I mean, there is no country in the world that can do that more effectively than the US. Um, and then a range of other factors which I won't s sort of belabor you with now because I think you've heard them. I, I would, um, you know, argue the case that um, f for your careers, um, this is going to be a situation that does not really change. Um, and that, you know, ultimately where we will move to slowly over that generation is a point of uh, multipolarity rather than a sort of a, a bipolar competition between the US and the Soviet Union. Um, I think you were next, yeah. Um, my question had sort of already been answered in part, but what, I guess, physical evidence do you see for, I guess, China opposing and challenging US, rather than primacy, but dominance, so primarily military dominance in Asia? Um, and I guess, Peter, how do you see that as being yeah, different too. Uh, well, the, the, the physical evidence is, is, is certainly quite substantial in terms of the military technology capabilities we see that China is developing. You know, China is, uh, I think, putting together an effective anti-access and area denial strategy, A2AD as it's called, which is really all about pushing the um, capacity of the Americans to bring their carriers forward within the first island chain. Um, and I think they've largely succeeded in doing that. Uh, I mean, you can have uh, debates as to whether or not they've um, got parity, for example, in terms of air combat capability. They, they clearly don't right now. Uh, but they have forced the Americans to rethink the strategy they would use for sailing those carrier battle groups into the First Island chain. Um, and uh, that's where the air-sea battle uh, concept now comes from, as the Americans think about fighting a war at a far more distanced sort of scale, you know, some 1,600 kilometres or so distance from the, from the Chinese coast. Now, China will, um, I think, um, you know, continue to um, advance in that area. Um, uh, I, I do disagree with some of my American friends that, that um, kind of dismiss their capacities to operate this equipment effectively. I, I think they've made tremendous advances, for example, in being able to deploy the uh, DF-21D, the um, 
the so-called maneuverable um, warhead with the capability of hitting um, targets at sea. So you know, they're coming along in, in great leaps and bounds. Where I think we will find the limit of Chinese military capability, though, is about at that first island chain. Um, and that is because of the investment which Japan and the US is putting into really constraining them within that environment. Uh, so that will be the arena for military competition um, over the next um, 10 years, 15 years or so. Um, beyond that range, in a military sense, China's not got much. You know, it's not a global power. It can sail ships to the Gulf for low threat anti-piracy operations, but that's really about as far as it goes. When it manages to extract nationals from Libya as it did using its own resources, you know, that is a triumph of, um, chi of Chinese um, force projection. Um, they're a long way to go before they have any capacity beyond that first island chain. No, I think, uh, I, I think that, that's exactly right. Um, I'd, I, I, in fact, don't think China's going to be have, have a capacity to project power by sea in the face not just of the United States but of Japan or any of the rest of us for as far ahead as we can see. I just think they'll be able to limit other people's project capacity to project power by sea likewise. But in terms of evidence of how does the capability turn into actual conduct, um, I, I think there's a very, a very stark uh, piece of evidence available to us right now, and that is the way in which China's conducted itself in relation to this, to the... Scarborough Shoals and the Senkakus in the time since the since the pivot. I, I, I've got to be careful of my analysis. I don't catastrophize too far, if you know what I mean. Um, so this might be wrong, but I think there's a very credible interpretation of what's been happening since then, which runs like this. In 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 2011, Obama declares that what I would see as the intention to preserve American primacy as a foundation for the Asian order. That's certainly the way they read it in Beijing. And Beijing decided to test this. Let's see. Now, if you want to test the foundation for American primacy in the Western Pacific, you test it at sea, because the sea is where American primacy has always been strongest. And so they set America a little test in the Scarborough Shoals. They pushed uh, the Filipino fishermen out of the Scarborough Shoals. Uh, the Philippines went back with their Coast Guard. The Chinese went back with their Coast Guard. It's a capital. <laughs> it's a Coast Guard with a capital K. And they... Um, uh, and the Philippines got pushed out, and the Philippines did what you'd expect a good US ally to do, which is to look over to their shoulder and say, please, sir, can I have the Seventh Fleet? And the United States said, no. I'm glad they did, by the way. But the outcome is that, I'm told, that the Chinese fishing industry is in, are enjoying the resources of Scarborough Shoals such as they are to this day. That is, China ended up winning that one. And what they did was they tested... America's willingness to use its force to resist China's ability to use its force to push around a US ally. It would be a bad story if it ended there, but it didn't, because then they decided, hey, it worked with the Philippines, let's try it on Japan. And Japan really matters. The Philippines is just the Philippines. Japan is really important. And that's what's happening in the Senkakus right now. I, I don't think, the Senkakus is a slightly complex story because they couldn't have done it without Tokyo. But but uh, I think the, the key driver of the Senkakus at the moment is, is, the, is the opportunity China is taking to demonstrate to Japan and the rest of us that the United States is in the end not prepared to stand up to China because of the risks and costs to the United States of get, going to war with China over something as insignificant as the Senkakus are simply too high. In other words, the threshold has been pushed up. Now, that becomes significant when you compare it and this is admittedly a thought experiment, with how the United States would have responded, say, in 1996, when it did respond to a crisis over Taiwan. But if the, if the Chinese had done what they were doing with the Senkakus in 1996, what would the United States have done? Well, I, my gut feeling is that the Seventh Fleet would have been there already. Um, but why is the Seventh Fleet not there now? Well, precisely because the risk of it being sunk is a lot higher now than it was then. The economic consequences to the United States of a rupture with China are a lot higher than they were then. All of those costs and risks have, have, have raised. Therefore, the threshold for US intervention has been raised. Therefore, American primacy has been, has been driven down. Now, you go to Tokyo and ask them how they feel about this, and they go, oh! Uh, I spent last the week before last in Tokyo. I've never seen so many anxious people. Uh, and they're right to be anxious. I mean, this is, this is the big one for them. Uh, I think it poses a, re a very real test for them and a very real test for the Americans. And, and 
you know, when you look, for example, at, uh, you know, Obama, uh, uh, Abe turns up in Washington in uh, February this year with this issue running hot and strong uh, with his briefing saying in very large type, get the Americans to promise to defend Sankaku's. Didn't happen. Did not happen. Uh, I, think that, I think that the Americans are in very grave risk of sending a message to the Chinese that the Chinese can do in the Senkakus what they did in Scarborough Shoals. Now, the, risk, the problem is I don't think Americans will in the end allow them to do that. I think they're sending the wrong message. I think in the end the Americans would be there. That's the good news. The bad news is that draws uh, the US into a China-Japan confrontation. And just in case you think that doesn't bother Australia, our government has chosen to attach HMAS Sydney to the Seventh Fleet. So Sydney will be there too. Well, it just goes to show how if you put two strategists in a room, you get different um, takes on the thing. What, what Hugh's just described to you is how the US is not containing China. Right? Oh, um, well. And yeah. so uh, now you, you've got to look at these two parts of the world in, um, in sort of different, different ways. But in, as far as the Scarborough Shoals are concerned, the Americans have made it clear that they are not in the business of looking after Southeast Asia's interests for them in that, in that part of the world. This is not a compelling American interest. It's not really treated by American military planners as sort of part of the, the war plan to fight the air sea battle with China. And they're going to leave it to the Southeast Asians and the Americans are not going to follow on after the Philippines on sort of weird adventurism to, you know, um, lay claim to, to the shoals. America is not containing China in the South China Sea. In uh, North Asia and the Senkakus, um, as Hugh says, vastly more different and uh, significant. And the Americans have made it very clear in, in, in relation to the most recent examples of <coughs> Chinese provocation that they recognise Japan has administrative control over Senkaku. And, you know, I, I take that to be the Americans saying to the Chinese, that's the red line, guys. And um, now, you know, will China continue to push the system with aircraft over flights and fishing boats going in? Absolutely. But I think we've probably reached the limit of what the Chinese are going to be prepared to do on that situation. Uh, sorry, there was a one oh. question over here. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, like, developing power in Asia or wanting to gain power in Asia that can ultimately destroy North Korea. What do you think of those kind of missile power trips? Sorry, I'm not here. What do you think China and the US want to use missile the power, power. that Um, uh, I think um, uh, the way I read it, um, I think the pattern of Chinese military capability development in the last few decades, well, particularly since 1996, has been uh, very precisely to um, uh, challenge American maritime power projection capabilities in order to put China in the position to challenge American primacy as the foundation of the Asian order in exactly the way they're now doing it. Now, the reason I read that differently from Peter is that when I see the United States not supporting one of their allies against Chinese pressure in the South China Sea, and when I see the United States only very ambiguously supporting, if they are, and I, I'm a bit less optimistic than Peter is about the tone of the US, of US um, uh, propositions on this, um, uh, I see the United States stepping back from its support from its allies and in doing so stepping back from its position of primacy. What did primacy mean? It meant that America set the rules and if you tripped over them, if you stepped over them, then, you'd ha then America would, would, would muscle up against you. Now China is, I would say, clearly tripping over the rules, stepping over the, outside the boundaries, and the United States is choosing not to do anything about it because the balance of military capacity has moved in this one very specific way, but the way that counts. A very focused development of capability by China specifically matched to its strategic objectives, and that's what they're doing. Now, what's the United States trying to do? Well, um, the United States is trying to think of a way to restore what it's lost as China's sea denial capability has increased. And as Peter said, they have an answer to that. It's called the SC battle. Um, and the answer is you've got to restore your capacity to project power by sea by destroying China's sea denial capabilities or A2AD uh, capabilities. And the problem with that, the problem with the SC battle is in order to do that, you have to undertake a long, sustained strike campaign against a whole lot of targets on the mainland of China. 
maybe a month or so. Um, and what you, in other words, in order to defend the Scarborough Shoals or the Senkakus, you have to go to war with China, with the capital GTW. Um, and of course, that's massively escalatory. No one's going to take that risk. The, 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 um, the threshold for intervention is driven up. And so the air sea battle ends up not being a solution for America at all. In fact, it just, the, 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 fact, the, the air sea battle demonstrates precisely the success of the Chinese strategy. Oh, I, and typically, I, I don't myself think China's going to achieve primacy. It's not going to achieve what America's had because there are going to be too many other strong powers. But what would China like to do? What does China want? Uh, we, we don't know. They don't know. Um, uh, but, but I think, um, I, I think the, the sort of best guess is that they want primacy. They want to lead Asia. When they talk about leading, when they think about leading Asia, then they sort of lie awake at night dreaming of the China dream. I think what they have in mind is not that they do to Asia what Stalin did to Eastern Europe or what the Japanese tried to do to Asia in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. I think they want to do to Asia what America's done to Asia. That is, they want to be the welcomed and accepted and revered leader. Now, I agree with Peter. I think their chances of getting there are pretty low, but that's, but that's what they want. And viewed from China, they don't think that looks as unreasonable as it does when viewed from Washington or Canberra. But they're not going to get that. Uh, this goes back to somebody asked me, you know, whether ever means ever. Uh, I, I think the chances of China being accepted as the primary power in Asia is very low. Um, and I think its capacity to impose that on the region is very low. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not going to push for it. But the real question is not what they want, but what they'll settle for. At what point will I say, well, I wanted that, but I'll settle for this. You know, I want you to buy my car for $20,000, but I'll sell it for fifteen. dollars um, So what's their, what's their bottom line? M my sense of their bottom line is they won't settle for anything less than being treated as an equal. That's why I use this you know, provocative phrase. Now, what does being treated as an equal mean? There's about four chapters in that. But psychologically, it's a very simple proposition that, that you accept uh, the other country absolutely you, no subordinate element of subordination in the relationship and uh, uh, and I think that's you know if you ask what in the end is China going to be willing to use its armed forces to do it will keep using its armed forces until it's until it's put itself in that position I think one of the reasons for that and this is just a half by Ch Peter's point about China's sense of weakness is that the Chinese leadership do feel that they need to provide the Chinese people with something they want and it is the second refrigerator and the first car and the investment flat. But it's not just that, because the Chinese are no, lo no more simply focused on money than we are. They, they want China to be wealthy and strong, is the slogan that they've been using for the last 150 years. And by strong, they mean respected. They have an image of China's place in the world, which draws on 5,000 years of history an extremely vivid sense of 200 years of humiliation, a phenomenal sense of pride in what they've achieved in the last few years, and a combination of optimism and pessimism, exactly as Peter says. I mean, it's a very weird... They're very hopeful about where they're going. Of course, why wouldn't they be? But they're also very anxious about whether they're going to make it work. I don't think that makes it easier. I think that makes them edgier people, harder to deal with in some ways. And so I think that's, that's what drives this sense of, uh, of wanting to be treated at least as an equal and why I'm pretty sure they're not going to settle for less. Respect, I think, is the key. Respect to uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you go there, you get this narrative of yes. you know, several hundred years of repression from yeah. the West, yeah. of okay. which we were a part. Yeah. Now they take you to the National Museum and remind you about how Australian forces were there in that's the right. second or you, or you can go to the War Memorial and see what we stole. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Literally, the War Memorial. Okay. Bold as brass, we stole this from the Summer Palace. <laughs> And, and <laughs> it was the last time we marked across Tiananmen Square. <laughs> it's never going to happen again, guys. Oh, it's, 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 oh, it's, it's there on Wednesday, mate. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, and, and along with this sort of quest for respect comes the sense of frustration that they're not yeah. getting it and that the soft power isn't working. <laughs> Which is true. I mean, yeah, you, can, yeah. you can go from you know, Kenya to uh, Tonga and, um, and see frustration with... Yeah. The sort of uh, Chinese mercantilism, China, uh, Chinese uh, aid, uh, they, they really struggle to understand how it is that the model is not selling. And, and that refer, I go back to my earlier comments about, you know, if you 
if you want something that looks like primacy, you have to have a model that the rest of the world wants to adopt. Now, um, I think we've got time for maybe one or two quick questions and uh, one long Q answer, and um, then we'll be uh, <laughs> getting close to the end of the day. So, over, over there. Try it. Yeah. Well, a dyad, if not a triad. I mean, I think that they're looking to um, significantly strengthen their at sea um, intercontinental ballistic missile capability, and, and they certainly have sufficient plans in place to point to, um, I think, what is going to be a very credible um, second strike capability. So, yep, they, that's that's part of the objective. I think that does help to buy a bit of respect in, uh, in Washington. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think we've seen the journey that the Americans have been on and are going on uh, over the last 10 years or so around the question of do we accept that we will be in a relationship with China built around mutually assured destruction in the way that we were with the Soviets. Um, it's been quite hard for the Americans to come to terms with that reality and uh, I, I mean, but we're pretty close to that point right now. And um, I think that the Americans in their heart of hearts sort of know that that's, um, that's a reality. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's worth bearing in mind there's only the third part of the triad, the manned aircraft part, because air forces are so bloody determined to hang on to the stuff. Um, there's, no, there's no good operational reason to, to keep manned aircraft in the mix, um, but uh, at least at the strategic level, um, but even at the even at tactical level. Uh, China is very strongly committed to maintaining a minimum deterrent capability and they will keep on building to give them a high level of confidence that the other guys have a high level of confidence that they can get some nukes on high value targets in the, in the United States after, no matter how devastating the strike. And, um, and I think there is an, there has been an element in US strategic thinking for a while that maybe they can achieve nuclear primacy against China and, and uh, launch a successful first strike against them. And I've always thought that was uh, smoking something inappropriate because I just think the Chinese, it's not very hard for the Chinese to just keep on building that stuff. The interesting question as to whether the Chinese haven't or uh, have yet or uh, will sometime soon move past the posture of, you know, minimum deterrence no first use to the point where they start flirting with the idea of using nukes first. It goes back to the answer I gave the question about about nukes earlier. I think uh, there is at least a fair bit of evidence kicking around the, the community of people who study Chinese nuclear strategy obsessively, most of them Americans, uh, that, that the Chinese are, are making that move and, or at any rate they have the capability to make the move and whether they wouldn't in a crisis, even if they hadn't declared a policy change, believe it or not, actually do something different. Uh, is, is quite high, um, but I think there's very little chance they'll try and build the kind of arsenals that the United States or the Soviet Union had during the Cold War, because the size of those arsenals was very much driven by features of the US-Soviet conflict, particularly the fact that it had that very strong continental component in Western Europe, which are just not present in the US-China story. Maybe one last question? with some of the provocations coming out of there, we've seen a much stronger tone out of China and possibly something where the US is starting to gain more traction. Well, I think the Chinese are very frustrated with the North Korean regime right now. Um, uh, it suits China to have North Korea, but it doesn't suit China to have a nuclear-armed North Korea. Uh, and so the Chinese position has always been that we'd like the North to denuclearize. Um, uh, I, I think that they're finding the current regime uh, uh, as, as, as impenetrable and difficult and um, puzzling to deal with as, as, as everybody else. And certainly they're always at pains when they talk to others to say you have to understand that our capacity to shape and influence what's going on in the north is much greater than is generally assumed to be the case. 
beyond sort of blunt instrument, look, let's just stop sending them food or sending them fuel oil or something of that nature, which again doesn't really work to China's interests because, you know, then they've got a massive refugee problem on their borders. Um, why I think this is frustrating for the Chinese is as annoying as the new Kim regime is, um, their deepest uh, strategic interest is maintained by having the North as a buffer state um, against um, a potential unified, possibly nuclear-armed Korea, which does not suit their interests at all. And so I think that they're perfectly happy to the extent that they can to kind of allow this uh, regime to continue on, and they'll look for ways to try to control its uh, more eccentric uh, behaviour. But I, I actually do kind of take believe the Chinese when they say that they have less capacity to shape the behaviour of the regime, because what's driving the regime is survival, and um, uh, is really no different than, you know, Robert Mugabe and his uh, senior officers in Zimbabwe, they'll do anything to continue to survive. Um, all dictatorships are kind of the same, I think, in terms of their operating mode. Um, and so the North can um, continue to sort of push its own interests, which they see as very tightly bound to building a nuclear capability, even if that doesn't work, Chair, do you want to? Yeah. <coughs> well, thank goodness you'd never see a political party doing highly irrational things in a desperate desire to survive in our system. <laughs> um, uh, look, I'm gonna, I, I completely agree with Peter about the fact that the Chinese don't have as much control over North Korea as uh, the rest of us want to, want to think. People think that they've got a joystick. All they've got is a switch. They can pull the plug and turn the whole thing off, but they can't control what it does. And anyone doubts that, they should go to work in IP and spend a bit of time working on the relationship with Papua New Guinea to see how you can have a really close relationship with a much weaker country right next door to you that's very dependent on you, which still doesn't do what you bloody want them to do. <laughs> um, scars, yes, you bet. Um, but I take a contrarian view. That is, I think the United States needs North Korea much more than China does. Because in the end, the Chinese are the ones that will control what happens on the Korean Peninsula if and when the Korean People's Workers' Party um, starts falling apart. And when that starts to happen, they will go to Seoul and say, hi guys, here's the deal. We can prop these guys up and keep North Korea as a separate country, or we can allow it to fall into your arms, and we'll help you fall into, it, into your arms reasonably gracefully. There are about 37 conditions in this short document that we're about to give you, and number one is US troops off the peninsula. And the Koreans will say, yes, we agree, we accept. So if the United States wants to preserve a position on the Korean Peninsula, it requires North Korea. If China wants to get the US troops off the, off the Korean Peninsula, it's got to let North Korea go. And I think years ago, decades ago, the, Koreans, the, the Chinese reached the point where the preservation of, of Korea per se, North Korea per se, as a sort of ideological soulmate, cease to be a strategic objective for theirs. They're simply, they, they don't want to bring the crisis on for exactly as Peter says, it'll be a terrible mess. But when it comes, I think the, uh, the, the, it is a very high likelihood that China will manage that in ways that suit China's interests. Now, how bad would it be for the United States no longer to have force on the Korean Peninsula? Actually, not necessarily that bad, um, because in the end it costs the United States quite a lot. And keeping North Korea in a box is you know, in the end, a kind of a second order issue. It's something you've got to do because it's there. But if I was the United States, I'd be very happy to be saved whatever the bill is now, 40,000 anyway, some vast number of US forces there. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, I, I don't think it's a, a, a deal breaker for the United States the way losing Japan would be. Uh, but I, I, I tend to think that the Chinese are quite happy to, um, to deal with the thought of a unified Korea. And the Americans, will lose the peninsula, will lose South Korea's strategic asset if they do. The question is, how does that leave the, the, the Koreans? Uh, my experience has been, and this is necessarily anecdotal or impression, impressionistic, that the Koreans are the people in Asia most relaxed about their capacity to deal with a strong China. Um, it's not that they think it's going to be a doddle, but compared with the Southeast Asians or the Japanese, they think, oh, yeah, oh, well, we've, done, we've done this, you know. They're, they're, they're difficult people to deal with, but we know how to handle them. Um, and, of course, they would probably be nuclear armed, so they'd have that little advantage on their side. So uh, I think this could be an interesting one to watch. Um, and just to get to show how I can differ with you on these things, I, I, you, you see, I've always had the view that the secret beneficiary of the US alliance network in the Asia-Pacific is China. 
And one of the great benefits they have by having the US and South Korea is they avoid the unified nuclear armed Korea, mm. which is not necessarily going to be a friend of China.